Thank you, Anthony. I'm John Denniston. I am the chairman of an agricultural impact company that is in significant part driven, from my perspective, by Pope Francis's call for a more inclusive form of capitalism. And I will describe that. But first, I want to just play off some of Anthony's comments, uh, which I thought were terrific. I was lucky to be invited two months ago to an impact investing conference at the Vatican. 50 people from around the world attended this. And <laughs> it was led by Cardinal Turkson of Ghana. And um, it's interesting, the tie to your comments. So Cardinal Turkson began the conference by reporting that from the Pope's perspective, Pope Francis's perspective, the two things crying out in our world today are creation and the poor. Exactly what you said. And uh, the, that Pope Francis is frustrated that there's all this talk about how we're working on the environment and how we're managing our economic structures to help the poor, but really, it's moving at a glacial pace. And so what I want to do before telling you about the impact company that I'm very actively involved in, companies called SharedX, offer a couple of reflections uh, on business and economics through the lens of Laudato Si, the Pope's encyclical, Care for Our Common Home. And I'm going to do it through an op-ed written by the syndicated com columnist George Will. The headline of which was Pope Francis Fact-Free Flamboyance. An op-ed written about the encyclical, Laudato Si. You should read it. Well, yeah, the encyclical, but also, also the op-ed, which, <laughs> which is tremendously entertaining. Uh, basically, what George Will says in his op-ed is, does the Pope not know that the free market has lifted millions out of poverty? Does he not know that we will invent technologies to address the environmental issues that have come in our time? Does he not know his proposals will in fact hurt the poor? Does he not know? My observation is <clears throat> you see a lot of reaction in the media to Pope Francis and this encyclical in, in particular where it's pretty obvious to me that those people haven't read it. The Pope, in fact, says in his encyclical, he's stronger and he marvels. That's the word he chooses. We should marvel at the alleviation of human suffering, the innovation and invention and entrepreneurship have brought across the entire economy. And we should do more of it. We should rejoice in Pope Francis's words. So the observation that I've made, uh, and I'll use different words, but a similar message, Anthony, to what you said is, I think that what has emerged in our culture is an alternative theology. And the name that I put on it is the Church of Market Fundamentalism. That the market's always right. The free market inherently gets us to the right result, optimal economic growth, optimal social outcomes, optimal environmental outcomes. That the formula of each of us in our own self-interest, trying to maximize our economic behavior, achieves ideal outcomes across the board in the world. Of course, that's not true. It's obvious on its face. So it's interesting to note uh, the, the term that's widely used to describe this alternate theology is the invisible hand. 
coined, sort of, by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. The invisible hand gets us to these outcomes. There's a speech given 13 years after the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Speech was given by America's first president, George Washington. It was his inaugural address. And he used the term invisible hand not to describe the free market, but to describe the providence of God, of the Holy Spirit. And he marveled. And how did our country come together? How was it that I stand before you? How is it that we've come together against all odds? His answer is it was the invisible hand of God. And you can see that, that term, the invisible hand, widely used in that era to describe a theological concept, not an economic one. And yet, the term's been hijacked so that when in our culture today we hear the term, the invisible hand, we bow to Adam Smith and the perfection of the free market. Some describe Pope Francis as a radical, a Marxist. How dare he? As Anthony said, actually, if you look at conventional Catholic social teaching, hearkening back to Pope Leo XIII in 1891, in his encyclical, Rerum Novarum, it's all there, echoed over the, the decades, over the century plus, by Pope Paul VI, St. John Paul, Pope Benedict. The only thing that's new is how Pope Francis is saying it in his own colorful fashion. The Catholic social doctrine is the same. But the reaction has changed. So what's changed? Catholic social teaching has been constant for 125 years. What's changed? And in my view, what's changed is the emergence of the church of market fundamentalism. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis tries to identify what's changed, and he, has sa he says it's the emergence of individualism, away from community, just as Anthony told us. I would add to that what Anthony told us, the hollowing out of the middle class due to inequality. That's destabilizing and creates certain beliefs. So before getting to shared acts, the last thing I want to say is, uh, in my opinion, the supply-side economic theory, let the wealthy make their money, everybody does well, it's the wrong question. The question that that, that theory asks is, does supply-side increase economic growth? Well, of course it does. But that's the wrong question. A better question is, does supply-side economics drive the optimal economic growth? And furthermore, is the only goal that we have as a society economic growth? Do we have social objectives too? Do we have environmental objectives as well. And as Anthony says, there's a lot of academic data now that says that supply side actually doesn't achieve optimal economic growth. Why is that? Because injecting prosperity in the bottom and the middle of the pyramid is going to get spent in the real economy faster instead of being saved. Therefore, higher shorter term GDP growth. It's intuitive. There's hope in the form of the impact economy. Uh, I spent three days earlier this week in Salt Lake City, Utah, 
attending an impact investing conference. This movement is flourishing. It's growing. What is it? An impact company is one that has two goals. The first is to generate profits, just like any other for-profit company, but also a for-profit company that integrates as a central part of its business plan doing good for the community in some form or fashion. It could be employment, a living wage. It could be education. It could be health. And all manner of companies out there are moving in this direction. And in particular, the millennial generation is all about it. If you go to the business schools, the leading business schools in our country, the demand from the grassroots, the students, the millennial generation, to have a career where they can make money and do good is off scale. I've never seen anything like it before. We're experiencing that firsthand at Shared X when we go to universities and tell our story. So briefly, Shared X, we are a, an impact agriculture company. We grow high value specialty crops in emerging countries and we're seizing on this phenomenon in agriculture called the yield gap. The yield gap is the astonishing differential in bushels per acre when comparing a developed and an emerging country farmer. It can be factor five, factor seven, factor 10. And the only reason for the difference, or the main reason for the difference, is our farmers in the developed world have advanced sustainable farming techniques and the knowledge by which to apply them. And the farmers in remote areas of emerging countries do not. That's the reason. And so in one sentence, our business plan at SharedX is to collapse the yield gap by deploying the most advanced sustainable farming techniques and also to share those techniques with our neighbors, the smallholder farmers. It's been really a joy to uh, travel this country and some of the world to encounter and dialogue with other impact entrepreneurs. And it's a different, this conference that I was at this week and the one that I attended in the Vatican two weeks ago, it's a different kind of feeling and a different kind of dialogue because everybody there in some form or fashion is looking to use the profit motive to change the world for the good. It's not just about the money. So we're, we're moving very quickly to try to uh, do our part in that. I'm going to close now and then uh, go to your questions. But first, I want to quote from Laudato Si, very end of Laudato Si. This is what Pope Francis says. When we ask ourselves what kind of world we leave behind, we are led inexorably to ask other pointed questions. What is the purpose of our life in this world? Why are we here? What is the goal of our work and all our efforts? And what need does the earth have of us? We need to see what is at stake is our own dignity. Leaving an inhabitable planet to future generations is first and foremost up to us. The issue is one that dramatically affects us, for it has to do with the ultimate meaning of our earthly sojourn. Thank you.